Well, good morning. We are to Thursday. We're going to continue our devotional study of the book of 2 Corinthians. We're now in the 10th chapter. We are, this book has 13 chapters, so we're moving along pretty well. Paul's going to get into some of the personal aspects, and he's going to have to defend his ministry. As I've told you before, Paul had a somewhat contentious relationship with this church at Corinth. Now, he had founded this church. He was the one who started this church, but yet there was there were issues. Uh, the letter that he is writing them came after a previous letter that he called the severe letter. It seems that he had made what he called the painful visit to Corinth, and there had been some real problems there. Perhaps some people opposed him publicly, and no one stood up for him. And he left there really in a bad way. And then he fired off a letter that he called the painful letter or the severe letter. And so he wrote that and Titus has now delivered that letter and come back. And Paul realizes that, okay, the church has responded well. So he's writing them again, but there's still, there are still issues. And he's responding to attacks upon his ministry. And that's what he's doing. So we're going to begin in verse in chapter 10, where Paul says, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. Now, when Paul said this, I'm humble when I'm face to face with you, but I'm bold when I am away. Paul is being sarcastic. There's portions in this letter where Paul uses sarcasm to make his point because they're accusing him that oh, Paul's really rough and tough when he writes letters, but he's not much to speak of when he comes publicly. And so Paul's dealing with that, that attack upon him that somehow he's really weak when he comes face to face with people. So he said... I'm coming to you in the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He doesn't want to be coming in a harsh way, but he also understands that he's got to assert his authority because there are people who have come into this church who are asserting a false authority and they've gotten people to follow them. And this happens sometimes. So he goes on to say in verse two, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. So they had accused Paul of having secret sin. Some of them had. Some of the false teachers and maybe some of the people had believed it, that Paul had some kind of secret sin. He's really rough and tough in private and when he writes you a letter, but he's really not much to it. But he says, you know, I'm going to be bold in public toward those who have accused us falsely. And he goes on to say in verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. So this is a very important point. Paul says we walk in the flesh, and that's a human being. We walk in the flesh. We're fleshly people. We live as human beings. But he said, we don't wage war according to the flesh. In other words, our ministry is not a fleshly ministry. We don't use fleshly techniques. And this is a very important point people need to understand today. Because we live in a time, and we're not the only time that have had this. Other, other eras have had the same problem. That people think, oh, well, let's bring this in. This works in the business world. Or this works in this other venue. And he said, we don't wage war according to fleshly methods. And he goes on to explain how we wage war. In verse, uh, chapter, uh, verse 5 is a very important passage. Chapter 10, verse 5. He says, we do, um, excuse me, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now notice what he says the weapons of our warfare. He says we don't war according to the flesh, but the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God, and they can destroy strongholds. Strongholds is anything that raises itself up against the knowledge of Christ. He goes on in verse 5, we destroy arguments 
and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. He says, we destroy these things. There are, the world is filled with false philosophies, false ideologies. There were those in Paul's day, Greek dualism, a variety of other things that were false philosophies. We have them today. We have secularism, we have atheism, we have pragmatism, even within the church. Well, let's just find what works. Paul said, we don't wage our war. We destroy these philosophies. Notice he says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And so he is talking about opposing error with the truth. He is talking about that as Christians and as those of us who engage in the world of ideas, those of us who proclaim Christ, we come at it with the truth of God, understanding that the truth of God has the power to destroy these fleshly, worldly, satanic strongholds. And he says, we destroy every argument that raises itself up against Christ. There are a myriad of arguments, both in Paul's day and in our day, that are against the, the, the gospel of Christ. And some of them are very subtle. Some of them have creeped into the church in a very subtle way. Uh, they're compromising philosophies. Well, we just need to love everybody without the truth of God being proclaimed. You know, and there's other things, pragmatism, we have to bring in these worldly philosophies. They would never say it that way, but that's what happens. And so here in Corinth, they had that too. They had these false teachers that had come in. Every indication is they were skilled in Greek rhetoric. Now, Greek rhetoric was a way, it was prized, a way of speaking, uh, lofty speaks, speaking, able to give good speeches, to use the techniques of Greek rhetoric, Greek and oratory. And Paul spoke with simplicity of language. Now, Paul was as intelligent as anybody could be, but he spoke in a simplistic, simple way toward people. So the philosophy that the false teachers had brought in was a worldly philosophy appealing to people's flesh. Most worldly philosophies appeal to the flesh. The worldly philosophies today appeal to the flesh. But we are called to confront these philosophies with the truth of God in accordance with his word. So he says, we destroy arguments and everything, every lofty opinion against the knowledge of Christ. And we do that for proclaiming the truth of God. Understanding that in the proclamation of the truth of God, the truth of Christ, the gospel of Christ, there is a, the Holy Spirit works in the midst of that. Notice he said, our weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, earthly strongholds. God can take care of those things, but he calls upon us to preach the truth, to proclaim the truth. And he says in verse six there, uh, they being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So he is actually speaking of discipline within the church. They had had to deal with that. In the first letter uh, that he wrote, the, first, the letter of 1 Corinthians, which may have been the second letter he had written them, but this, the letter of 1 Corinthians, they dealt in chapter 5 with a man who was dealing and living in open sin with a woman who was his stepmother. So he had taken up with his stepmother. And the church had not dealt with that. The church had not mourned over it. Paul said, you're prideful. You've not mourned as you should have mourned. So the church had to deal with that. In the early part of 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about the judgment against this man. So the question is, was that the man that had committed sin in 1 Corinthians? Or was it something else? And I think the evidence kind of implies that when Paul had made his painful visit, someone stood up and publicly opposed him and disregarded him. And so the church dealt with that and punished that. And the man repented, seemingly. And so this, these things are very important. 
Church discipline is very important. Uh, we live, live in a time where people don't want to do anything to upset people. But the word of God says the truth has to be proclaimed and there has to be a discipline within the church. And, and we have to do that. Paul talks about the importance of these doctrines that come against false philosophies. Now, when we go a little further, Paul's going to go even more into this defense of his ministry because he's going to go into more about the, oh, yeah, they say you, Paul frightens us with his letters. And he's not much in public. He said, you just know whatever I am in my letter, that's what I'll be in public to you. So we're going to get to that next time. We'll go into more detail of this. Now, I want to say something else. I talked about that I was going to start another teaching on a weekly basis with uh, out of the books of the Bible, out of something in the Old Testament, uh, maybe out of the prophets. And so as I have thought about that, I, I'm going to do that. I, I, it's going to be a little ways down the road, a few weeks down the road, because I want to really get ahead of the game on that. And so... But just stay tuned. I'm probably going to create a public Facebook page just for the ministry, not to be anything pretentious or anything, just so that there's a place that I can put all of this stuff uh, so it's easy to find. So be on the lookout for that, and I will let you know. And we thank you for listening, and uh, let me pray. Father, we come before you today. Thank you for this day that you've given us and all the grace and the mercy that you've given us. And Father, we thank you that the weapons of our warfare are mighty in you to the pulling down of strongholds. And so, therefore, we oppose the doctrines of evil with the truth of God. We thank you for that. Bless each one that listens today and help us to follow you with a whole heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a wonderful day.